Are we ready to roll, uh, Bonnie? Yes, we are at this time. OOC committee members, if you can go ahead and please turn on your cameras so that we can ensure a quorum. Okay, and Terry, are you here? Okay, Terry Moore is not, she is a committee secretary. Um, she's not here, but we can go ahead and, oh, there she goes. She's admit, admitted now, one moment while she turns on her audio. Okay, we may proceed. Uh, good morning, I'm calling toward the meeting of the Operation Oversight Committee. Uh, the chair, Mr. Chanke, who requested that I run the meeting. Um, any additional instructions, um, Madam Secretary, the roll call? Okay. As this meeting is being conducted virtually, I will call do a roll call of the trustees to confirm attendance. Mr. Knox, Mr. Bernstein, Ms. Gray. Here. Present. Mr. Oakham? Here. Mr. Moore? Here. Mr. Robbins is, Mr. Robbins, thank you. Mr. Robbins is on vacation and Ms. Zapanta is not in attendance. Mr. Pryor? Mr. Harris? Chair Kehoe? Vice Chair Santos? Present. Staff participating. Kehoe, Kehoe is here. Okay. Staff participating in the meeting include CEO Santos Kreiman, Deputy CEO Louis Lugo, AEO JJ Popovich, Chief Counsel Stephen Rice, John Harrington, Staff Counsel, um, Kathy Delano, Sami Vong, Bob Schottfeld, Michael Warren from Systems, James Beasley, Roberta Van Nortrick from Admin Services. Jolene Williams, Penny Campbell from Karcher Campbell and Associates. Trustees, please use the Zoom chat option to be placed in queue. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute your mics until you are ready to speak, and we may now proceed with the agenda. Great, thank you. Uh, since uh, uh, Mr. Les Robbins is absent today, Ms. Uh, Vivian Gray will be a voting member. Um, Having said that, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of July 7, 2021. So moved. Did okay, you hear that? Second. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Gray, you. I'll second. second. Okay. It's been moved and second. Any uh, discussions, amendments, corrections? Hearing none, uh, please um, roll call. Mr. Oakham? I. Ms. Gray? I. Mr. Kehoe? I. And Vice Chair Santos? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. The next item on the agenda is public comment. I don't know, I, don't, I believe we don't uh, have any requests for public comment. Is that true? We, that's true, we have no requests. Great, thank you for that. Moving forward, next item on the agenda is item three, action items, section eight, recommendation by Mr. Rice regarding the uh, teleconference meeting policy. Mr. Rice? Yes, uh, Vice Chair Santos, uh, committee members and trustees, good afternoon. Uh, this item is to review the Board of Retirement teleconference policy that was adopted by uh, the, the Board of Retirement in 2019. Um, the Brown Act has very strict requirements and uh, very strictly regulates the ability and, and the way in which uh, te uh, teleconference meetings are held by a legislative body such as the Board and its committees. The uh, virtual meetings that we've been holding for the past year and a half uh, during the pandemic would not have been possible uh, under the Brown Act as it's written. The reason we've been able to do that is because of an executive order that was 
issued by the gov uh, governor in March of 2020, relaxing um, those requirements. Uh, those requirements are going to expire uh, the way things stand right now, uh, barring any further action by the governor or some urgency legislation uh, at the end of September. So we will be going back into um, a, a, the world of, of a strict uh, 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 Brown Act compliance with the, 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 the requirements of that law as far as the con conduct of tele teleconference meetings. That's going to change um, things uh, for us. Uh, there was, a, in light of that upcoming September deadline, there was a request by certain trustees to bring the teleconference uh, meeting policy back to uh, the the boards and it, for the board of retirement it would be through this committee uh, for for review to see whether there's a way uh, by changing uh, the teleconference policy we can mitigate some of the effects that may linger of COVID uh, uh, after the uh, end of uh, September and allow some more flexibility with respect to teleconferences. Now. One thing that the committee can't do, the board can't do, is change the the uh, the rules of the, of the Brown Act. So after September 30th, whatever we do, uh, it will be subject to uh, the the um, Brown Act requirements. What the what the board did in in 2019 in response to to some events uh, and some some uh, trustee. Uh, discussions that were going on uh, at that time about how, how teleconference meetings were, 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 when they were held, how they were agendized, and who could participate. The, the board adopted the, the, the current teleconference meeting policy. It's a, it's a limited policy. It only allows uh, teleconferences in three uh, defined uh, circumstances. The first circumstances is when a meeting of the board is noticed on less than 20 days notice and a trustee can't attend because they're out of state or because they have health concerns. Um, the second way in which under the current policy a teleconference meeting can be held is in the discretion of the chair. And that discretion is currently unlimited. It's, it's just, it's in the discretion of the chair. Uh, and the third uh, uh, way in which a teleconference meeting can currently be held is if a individual trustee wants to have a teleconference meeting, brings a noticed motion to the board at the, the full board at the meeting before they want to hold a teleconference meeting and the board votes to authorize that teleconference meeting. So that's, that's a, a long process and not, and doesn't allow um, a very um, nimble um, action response to circumstances that might uh, in a, in a trustee's view warrant a teleconference meeting. Uh, so what, what I've, what I've done in the memo that you have before you is, is not, provide any um, specific red lines, but to put forward four areas of possible amendment for your consideration, and then also just listen to you for your for your direction as to how you think this policy should be redlined. Um, the four areas that, that, that I have suggested for your consideration are first, a paragraph, um, the teleconference meeting, meetings under the Brown Act shall be held when any federal, state, county, or Pasadena City uh, emergency health or safety order or other emergency order uh, is in place. Uh, the second suggestion uh, is to add language that Lacera shall hold teleconference meetings and under the act, but hold teleconference meetings when the chair CEO and the Director of Human Resources believe that the health interests of trustees and staff support it. And I say health, but I mean health and safety uh, interests of, of the trustees and staff. Uh, and with regard to this item, I do point out that the, that the, the uh, current policy gives the board unlimited discretion, but it doesn't actually prescribe um, the process that's, that's suggested in this item two in, in the memo. So it, it, it is additive to the, the current policy. The third suggestion is to expand the ability of tr individual trustees to request a teleconference meeting so that they don't have to ask for it um, over a month in advance and have full board approval and then subsequently actually have a teleconference meeting a, a, a week later, but to allow them to, to request and to receive a teleconference meeting uh, following the same timeline that's allowed for them to agendize items, which is 
five working days prior to a meeting. So under this, this suggestion, if, if the committee is interested in moving ahead with it, the, the, uh, the, and in any, any trustee could make a request which would be honored for a teleconference meeting provided it was submitted five working days before uh, a meeting was taking place. And the, the fourth suggestion or area of, of review I, I, I identify for you is to extend the, the teleconference meeting policy to board committees. Right now, the policy specifically provides that it does not uh, cover board committee. So there's no vehicle right now for there to be uh, teleconference uh, uh, meetings other than the inherent uh, power of the of the committee chair and the, and the board chair. So one, you, the, the policy could be revised to clarify that the, the criteria for holding a teleconference meeting apply to the committees as well as to the full board. There may be maybe other areas that you wish, wish to discuss, but with that, I'll, I'll end my remarks and I'm happy to receive your, your direction and to uh, answer any questions. Any questions, comments? All the actually most after developed um, and in light of the recent uh meeting uh, everything we seen uh there has a very good platform up um hold. And I think this is very forward thinking. I'm very appreciative of staff putting it together. I'm in support of it, and I'd be uh, willing to uh, make a motion to uh, adopt the recommended changes and bring them forward to the Board of Retirement for this. Uh, Fortunately, Mr. Kehoe, at least for me, the uh, the communications is not. Uh, Clear. Um, did anybody hear Mr. Kehoe clearly? So we can. No, uh, I didn't hear him. Comments? No, we didn't my under get it at all. My understanding, and Mr. Kehoe should probably confirm this, is that he was uh, moving that the policy um, be revised in these four areas and that the revised policy be advanced to the Board of Retirement. <laughs> Okay, I, I heard pretty much the same uh, as communicated by Mr. Um, Rice, and and it, I'm not sure if Mr. Key was in a position to write anything at this point, because I know he's a transit. Uh, but if uh, there is no objection, I will uh, move um, to include the four suggested items. Um, as described in the memo staff, because I believe that's what uh, I heard Mr. Kehoe um, wanted to include, and I'm in agreement with that. Um, I know Mr. Dorway Moore has a, qu has a question. Uh, yeah, Vice, um, Vice, excuse, excuse me, Vice Chair Santos, if I could just uh, interject here with the simple point that Mr. Kehoe confirmed in the chat that that was his motion. Oh, okay, good. So I will second the motion. And uh, now for discussion, uh, Mr. Waymore. Oh, thank you. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so I wanted to know um, I think that the process, the virtual process that we're using right now, um, streaming everything live, uh, addresses one of the issues about public participation and public awareness and being able to participate in the meetings, because I remember this um, part of the uh, teleconference uh, requirements in the uh, Brown Act was that you had to have notice of the location where you're gonna be teleconferencing and there has to be availability for people to come in and participate. Um, so I don't see that as a problem with the virtual meetings. So I wanted to know if, if virtual participation and live streaming will take care of that issue. And um, then so, also, excuse me. also wanted to know is, um, would, does this mean that in September, we're gonna go back to um, the default condition is a live meeting, unless all of these other actions take place for a telecom? 
Uh, so to answer the, the second question first, uh, Trustee Moore, yes, after September 30th, um, we'll be under uh, a pure, barring any, any, any changes between now and then, we'll be strictly under the Brown Act where the default is a live meeting and we can hold teleconferences in accordance with the Brown Act um, as may be modified by the board's policy. Now, what that means, and this gets to your first question, is, is that if, if all of you want to continue to have as a, as a whole virtual meetings, um, we can do that. However, five of you would need to be in L LA County. That's probably not an issue, but we would have to strictly, that has not been a requirement during COVID. Uh, five of you would have to be in LA County. All of you, we would have to post all of the places where you are uh, when, you, when, when, when you're attending the virtual meeting and those locations would need to be open to um, the public. Uh, one thing that we can do to mitigate the effect of that is that the Brown Act does provide that we can add a, an additional public location. It doesn't mean that your, locate, your individual locations don't still need to be open to the public, they do, but we can mitigate the impact of that by having perhaps the boardroom or some other location in the Lacerra building or elsewhere that is a designated public location. But we would have to, uh, Mr. Moore, Trustee Moore and other trustees, we would have to still comply with all of those noticing requirements, giving all the addresses of where you're gonna be and they would have, it, the agenda would have to be posted at all those locations and all those locations would have to be open to anybody who might wanna come in. Well, yeah, that, that's why that is a problem with me. And I think that this current environment should be impetus for us taking some initiative to have the legislature or make some proposals to kind of modify that. Because like I said, having the meetings live streamed and having the public able to participate in the meetings from wherever they are, kind of mitigates the whole effort in the original legislation to have the public get access to the board meeting and be able to participate by being in a physical location. So part of what I'm asking is, are we going to look at how we're conducting business now and identify ways to update the Brown Act to the current environment and just maybe go through SACRs or go through our legislative assistance and you start putting that out there so we can kind of update that law and make it a lot easier for us to do what we're doing. Yes, there are a number of bills in the legislature um, right now that are moving through the process that would uh, amend the Brown Act in um, various ways, uh, uh, given the, the, the experience of, of COVID and what's been learned uh, about the success of, of, of virtual meetings. Uh, there, there is still, there is controversy about that because there are certain um, groups that feel that that they have the right to to look in the face of their of their of their public officials when they're making decisions, but but there is there there are a number of bills that, that are moving their way through. A local government uh, gr uh, groups uh, are discussing with the governor um, an extension of the executive order, and it, it's possible. And I don't want to speculate on, on whether that's going to happen or not or go too far on it. But in light of the, the Delta variant surge and so forth, uh, uh, the governor may be open to, to a further extension, but we don't want to count on that. Uh, that's as far as I can go. So yes, there are proposals. We are monitoring them. Our legislative uh, uh, advocate in Sacramento is monitoring them, and we are staying abreast of, of the moves that are that are taking place legislatively and in the executive branch uh, to to uh, address the concerns that you have and other public officials have. Okay, and one last thing, when you um, update the uh, um, procedures that we'll have to uh, adopt to conform, um, will I be able to request uh, virtual participation for the next three months instead of every month? Um, 
we can we can work we can work that out uh, in in some way. Um, so you, you, you could, and you but again you're going to ha- unless there's some change. I just want to reiterate this because yeah. anybody who is doing this is going to have to have an agenda on their front door, and and the front door is going to need to be unlocked. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Any anybody else? Any other comments? Uh, Chair Santos, I, I put in a question. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to ask Mr. Rice, have we contemplated enforcement? Because in the past, we've had very limited use of telephonic meetings. This policy seems to be anticipating fairly broad use. And for instance, what are the consequences if people say they're going to be in one place, uh, but they're not? Uh, and to whom does enforcement responsibility fall? So if that was, if they said, and we noticed that a trust, that, that, that one location uh, was a, a teleconference location and a trustee was planning on being there, it turns out they were at a different location that was not on the agenda, that would be a Brown Act violation. Uh, and that all the, the, the sanctions and uh, uh, litigation exposure and so forth that relate to Brown Act violations would, would be out there. Uh, in terms of enforcement uh, by by us, I, I think we rely on the, the we have to rely on the the integrity uh, of our trustees. I think that's a, I, I would believe that's going to be a safe safe assumption. Uh, and and the, and and Bonnie and Linda would certainly uh, uh, in organizing it would be on top of where people are going to be and and make sure the details were followed in terms of of, of posting. Uh, and and uh, do what we can in terms of confirming that what we've noticed is in fact taking place. And if somebody is not at a at a we we learn before or during a meeting that that somebody is not at the location that was noticed, they would have to be excused from the meeting. We we would have to take that action to excuse them from the meeting, and they would not be permitted to participate. As we move forward with all this, that that's I think my my concern is education. That we're also used to as long as our Zoom is working. We can drive, we can, you know, we can go from one room to another. I, I just am concerned that there be an educational component so that we don't create gotcha moments for trustees after the, the Brown Act becomes enforceable again. So Trustee Bernstein building off of that, which is a, which is um, a, a, a very good point. Uh, the memo for the Board of Retirement, if this motion passes, will we'll, uh, raise that issue and, and, and propose some processes that would be put in place to, to address that issue. The policy will still provide that it is, the, it is the policy of the Board of Retirement that personal attendance is preferred, but we recognize the reality that the policy is being revised because we recognize the reality that we're really not out of this pandemic yet. And we have to, if the governor doesn't take action, the legislature doesn't action, take action, we have to take our own action with respect to this pandemic, as well as future health and safety crises to protect our, our trustees and, and, and staff by giving as much flexibility as we can. Thank you. So if I understand you correctly, Mr. Rice, is that there will be, assuming that this uh, motion passes, there will be an educational component um, and specifically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a violation of the Brown Act could potentially be a criminal offense, a misdemeanor. So I think an education for all of us is, is important so that everybody's aware that they can potentially um, have a criminal action against them in addition to all the civil penalties. Yeah, that, 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 the, main, the main issue is, is really main exposure as a practical matter is going to be uh, um, um, exposure in a, in a, in a, to civil litigation unless, and, and Brown Act demands under the Brown Act, uh, and there's a, a process for those demands, uh, un, uh, unless we were having a habit of violating, in which case then, yes, it becomes a, a totally different situation if, we, if, we're, if we're chronically or a trustee is chronically violating the law. Gotcha. Any other uh, questions, comments? I don't see any, and we do have a motion that has been duly second. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Oakham? Aye. Ms. Gray? Chair Kehoe? Aye. 
Vice Chair Santos? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you for that. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is subsection B, recommendation by Ms. Bisley, James Bisley, uh, regarding uh, recommendation to the Board of Retirement to approve the purchase of fiduciary uh, liability. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Vice Chair Santos, uh, uh, this is uh, JJ Popwich. I'd like to um, uh, do an introduction for a moment, if I may. Please. Uh, this uh, particular item has two parts to it. One part is the uh, request for a recommendation to the Board of Retirement for the purchase of uh, certain insurance, uh, which Mr. Beasley is going to go over. And then there's a second part uh, that addresses the timing uh, issues with cyber liability insurance. Uh, for future board approvals. And um, that part, um, uh, Mr. Lugo and I will address uh, after Mr. Beasley has addressed the first part um, before, hopefully with your uh, approval before the committee um, takes their vote. Is that, is that, would that be acceptable? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Beasley who will talk about the uh, insurance renewal process and the recommendations that uh, uh, he and the committee that uh, put these recommendations forward have come up with. Right. Beasley? You, JJ. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and trustees. I am James Beasley with Administrative Services Division. And before we begin, can you guys hear me? I want to make sure we, that you can hear me just fine. Okay. Yes, you're okay. great. Great. And before I begin, I would like to introduce Lacerra's insurance brokers from Carter Campbell and Associates. Today, we have Penny Campbell and Jolene Williams, who are here to answer any insurance related questions that you may have. Thank you, ladies, for your hard work and attending this meeting. Now, I come before you today to request that the committee recommend the Board of Retirement to approve the purchase of fiduciary and cyber liability insurance effective October 9, 2021. And moving forward, that the committee authorizes staff to present the insurance renewal options directly to the Board of Retirement to approve the recommendations and bypassing the committee in an effort to increase the number of quotes that we receive from the insurance carriers, which I will discuss further in a little bit. For the first recommendation, per the policy of purchasing goods and services, we are seeking authorization to purchase the fiduciary and cyber liability insurance policy since the premium amount for the coverage exceeds the CEO's signature authority of $150,000. At this time, we're requesting that Lacerra purchases the fiduciary insurance package through Hudson and Westchester with a premium of, three, premium of $324,126 and the cyber insurance with NES and Brit Global for approximately $230,000. We are still waiting for the final quote, which will be presented to the Board of Retirement next month. Now on to the second recommendation. Traditionally, the October 9th insurance renewal period start staff period staff would email the broker at the end of May, requesting that they start soliciting quotes from the insurance carriers for each line of coverage that are up for renewal. During the month of June, the brokers is, are working diligently on gathering quotes and putting together a proposal to present to the insurance renewal team in July. And in July, the insurance renewal <laughs> team thoroughly reviews the proposal, makes the decisions on carrier selection, and then prepares a memo to for the Board of Oper uh, uh, for the Operations Oversight Committee. And then in August, the selection and recommendation for the fiduciary and cyber liability insurance is presented to, uh, excuse me, um, the recommendation for cyber is presented to the committee. And in September, the Board of Retirement for approval. This timeline was de designed to mitigate the risk of expiring insurance policies from lapsing before obtaining final approval by the Board of Retirement. This renewal process is typically a four to a four and a half month process. With that said, I wanna dive into the issue a little bit further to give you an idea of what our concerns are. During the last couple of renewal periods, there were several insurance carriers that did not provide quotes. This is mainly because many reputable insurance carriers are reluctant to provide quotes prior to 90 days of expiration, as the underwriters are being more meticulous and cautious when measuring an organization's risk in regards to providing a quote. This is mainly due to the volatile hard insurance market that is being driven by catastrophic losses like large scales, flooding, fires, uh, cyber crimes and so on, costing billions of dollars in insurable losses. 
Additionally, the continued effects on global economic uncertainty is adding pressure to the insurance carriers operations. As a result, the carriers 90 day limit, the brokers are challenged with obtaining a competitive quotes from multiple carriers. And additionally, it is tremendously, it has tremendously reduced the timeline for the insurance review team to review the proposals made carrier selections and to prepare the memo for the operations oversight committee and to the board of retirement in a timely manner. We want to ensure that the broker has enough time to provide Lacerra with the ample number of carrier quotes and that Lacerra staff have enough time to review the quotes and policies in order to make a well-informed decision that best protects the plan, the trustees and Lacerra staff. I would like I would now like to invite JJ and Lewis back to discuss further on the recommendations and the next steps. Thank you, Mr. Chair and trustees for your time. JJ, Lewis. Thank you. I'll defer to Mr. Lugo uh, to begin it. Yep. Conversation. Yep. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Santos, trustees, and uh, James. Thanks again for your work and your team's work, as well as our insurance brokers. Um, you know, again, James did a good job of diving into the, some of the details as it relates to the timeline on why we're suggesting the Operations Oversight Committee um, allow the insurance renewals to go directly to the Board of Retirement. Essentially, as he laid out, um, we don't have a good representation of the marketplace. Uh, our insurance brokers are working diligently, but as you see within the memo, I think there is a um, list of um, brokers that didn't respond to our initial request um, and, and mainly um, within the cybersecurity side with all the recent events that were highlighted in the memo. Uh, so we're allowing, we want to allow for more time to get feedback and get a true representation of the marketplace to make an, um, an informed decision, decision as it relates to our um, fiduciary crime and cybersecurity insurance. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mr. Lugo. Uh, who's, who's next, JJ? No, that's uh, that's uh, explains the recommendation that we want to put forward, and that is specifically for the cyber insurance uh, to move that directly to board of retirement in the future, uh, given the the time frames. So, uh, Ms. Williams is on the on the line. I, I have a question for her. Yes. Hi, Ms. Ms. Williams. So how much time do you as a broker, you and your firm, uh, is needed uh, for your deliberation or evaluation of the different bids and, and make your recommendation to the staff? What, what's the time frame that you require to do something like that? Well, the carriers are reluctant to release quotes prior to 60 days in advance of the expiration or inception of the policy, uh, primarily because of the uh, changing conditions in the marketplace. Um, the minimum would be 60 days, but we get quite a bit more interest after the 60 day period between 60 and 30 days um, prior to inception of the policy. But uh, at 90 days, they are issuing what's called a indication uh, non-bindable indication. And with that, it does not guarantee that when the inception date um, it comes to fruition that they will bind that particular indication because they reserve the right to make changes based on the economy. And specifically with um, the cyber, there has been an influx of uh, ransomware claims. And I know you, you've probably seen it in the news where um, the underwriting is changing on a daily basis, uh, anywhere from the insurance carriers that currently provide the coverage are dropping out or they are uh, not accepting uh, new, new uh, insureds, or they're changing their limits, their deductibles, um, and also their conditions. For example, um, a recent uh, malware uh, violation started them putting an, a specific exclusion in their policies for that particular uh, Orion product. So we're seeing that on a regular basis, which means they will not honor any quotes uh, that are 90 days out. So uh, to answer your question uh, more specifically, 60 days would be the absolute minimum. Uh, 30 days, you'll have 
a multitude of quotes. And this is primarily also because of the hard market. The hard market is generating uh, a lot of uh, influx to underwriters of submissions from uh, multiple clients and they just can't keep up with um, all of the submissions that they receive. And generally they put them in priority of what is next. So in terms of timing, uh, 90 days out is not as pressing as some of the other submissions that they have. Thank you for that, Ms. Williams. Well, but one more question then, sorry. So as a consequence of the time constraints that we have right now, uh, the impact and the quality of the uh, uh, insurance uh, uh, is impacted, right? Because if we have more opportunity to evaluate other uh, carriers, perhaps the price will be less uh, in more comprehensive uh, coverage, is that? That is correct. Uh, in, in one regard, uh, you have several carriers that just will not participate in the renewal process because they can't produce quotes in a timely manner based on uh, the timeline we've presented. In other cases, um, during the process, we get initial quotes and then we negotiate terms and conditions. And so additional time is needed to present a final quote which is always in the best interest of Lacera to uh, maximize the coverage and minimize the premium as best possible. But that is a negotiating process uh, that goes on uh, throughout the renewal. So that time gives us uh, the opportunity to provide Lacera the best product available. So how can we remedy this now since we only have limited uh carriers who bid for this um, and we're having to go with them because of the time constraints. Can we limit the, uh, the, the time that this particular um, coverage will have for us to give us an opportunity, perhaps this is for Mr. Lugo, uh, to give us an opportunity to go back out into the market through uh, a broker, Ms. Williams, and see if there's better deals out there and if the board approves or the committee approves uh, that this matter to go directly to uh, the board of retirement. What was your opinion on that? Am I clear? <laughs> yep. <clears throat> so the current timeline, Trustee Santos, or excuse me, Vice Chair Santos, is um, right now us being able to provide a final package to, to the Operations Oversight Committee. Um, um, I'll defer to, to James in terms of if we were to go back, but I would imagine the insurance brokers and, and our insurance brokers to see whether or not we would be able to garner um, that activity but within the allotted time of um, the, the BOR meeting. But we're, we, we're operating now on the, on the presumption of the, the timeline that we, we were um, uh, given. So I don't know if uh, you know, it allows for modification, uh, James. Well, the, the current timeline that we've been doing it traditionally, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. So we're looking at, at seeing if we have the ability to, to just go straight to the board. So it gives that time in, in the front end so for the team to be able to review all the, the uh, quotes that come back from the, the brokers. So but, for, this, start, for this particular cycle, James, I would imagine we, we don't have the, the lead time needed to be able to um, do that for this particular cycle, which is what Vice Chair Santos, I think is referencing? Well, for this particular yes. cycle, we we um, we do actually have time still because the quotes, they're, they're still obtaining quotes and, and negotiating the terms and conditions. When we go back to the board next month, we could present the, to the board um, all the changes and, and, and uh, recommendations that, that is to the organization. Can we see Mr. Kiho came online. Um, can you come on, Mr. Kiho? Uh, yes. So, um, can, can we just uh, consider giving this delegate this to staff that responsibility um, as the CEO to make this the determination? Because I don't, I don't particularly see where the uh, board is getting rid of and uh, I think the reason why we comment. So why don't we just 
And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Kehoe, it was uh, difficult to understand what you were saying. Um, I, I think Mr. Kehoe was suggesting that we delegate uh, the retention of the uh, carriers to the staff subject to full board approval. Is, is the, hopefully that is the right? Yeah. Uh, that, that didn't make sense. Okay, so so if I understand, yeah. okay, so if I understand this correctly, uh, then the, the motion would be to delegate this matter to the staff to uh, continue to work with a broker, Ms. Ms. Williams and, and others, uh, and uh, for the staff to then come back directly to the board of retirement uh, with a final recommendation. If that is what Mr. Key was saying, I'm in favor of that. That works. That works? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So, okay, so we do have uh, a motion by Mr. Key, second by, by me. Any further comment, discussion, objections? Hearing, seeing none. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Olcom? Mr. Olcom? Ms. Gray? Okay. Okay. Ms. Gray? Hi. Chair Kehoe? Vice Chair Santos. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you very much for that. Next item on the agenda is, the, um, well, we're done with action items down to reports. Uh, section four, subsection A, uh, operations and oversight uh, briefing, Mr. Popovich. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I My uh, re report is the full report I have for the uh, committee this month. If there's any questions, I will be happy to answer questions. I don't see any requests or questions or comments. Um, I'll move the agenda forward then. Okay. And that uh, subsection B, Overview on the status of La Sierra uh, Wi Fi project. Any comments, questions on that? Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'd like to introduce Sami Vong. He is an interim assistant manager in the systems division. He served in this role for the last 13 months, where he oversees our technology infrastructure. And um, he would like to present a uh, presentation on one of the current projects that's being conducted by the infrastructure group. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sami. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Santos and members of the committee. I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Bonnie and Alex, if you could allow me to share a screen, I could pull up the slide presentation. Alex, can you please make him a co-host? So good afternoon, trustees, again. Um, so I would like to share with you a project overview and the implementation of uh, Lacera's Wi-Fi project. As we mentioned in the memo, Lacera has traditionally been a wired infrastructure where we use a wired connection to connect to the internet and to facilitate, facilitate business operations. So as part of the 2021 
2020-2021 mid-year budget adjustment, staff had requested funding to uh, bring an enterprise Wi-Fi uh, solution to Lacerra's offices, which the board did approve. So we're happy to share with you now a status of the project, as well as an overview of some of the work that we've done so far. So with bringing Wi-Fi to Lacerra, we wanted to realize a few uh, advantages and benefits with a wireless infrastructure. The no no number one being um, fostering productivity and collaboration within our staff members. So the traditional um, working situ situation for Lacerra staff in the past has been a stationary workstation in an office or cubicle. Now with wireless, we are able to expand that to more flexibility and allow staff to move around the office um, by assigning them a laptop as their primary working station, having it connected to a docking station at their desk where they will be connected to our wired infrastructure. But if they need to work at another office, another division or move, around, move about our facility, they can undock that, that laptop and our wire, wireless network will connect to that machine and they can freely move about as they see fit. This will give them the freedom and flexibility to have access to our internal network, key documents, and any other software or tools that they should, should need as part of their day-to-day -day task. Um, what Wi-Fi also allows our staff to do is have multiple devices connected to our network at the same time. So we are seeing certain changes in the working, working world now where not only is a PC or a laptop somebody's uh, equipment that they, they rely upon, but tablets and cell phones have now become integral parts of a day-to-day -day work life. Um, so that our Wi-Fi connections will allow flexibility in that regard as well. From a network expansion and scalability perspective, having a Wi-Fi wireless in, um, network will allow us to scale up and scale down as needed. So this means that we can actually add new staff to our network without actually having to run wires by allowing them to sit anywhere. And that's key with right now with the um, COVID pandemic where social distancing requirements are still in effect. So if we were to bring on new staff, we could effectively place them anywhere within the suite of their um, respective divisions and allow them access to our network via a Wi-Fi connection. And the last point I wanted to make in terms of some of the advantages for Wi-Fi is along the value added service this provides to our members, visitors, and guests who hopefully in the near term, we'll be able to visit our facility once again. So Lacerra is a service-oriented and appointment-based uh, organization um, as, as it stands right now with our member service center. So when the members make an appointment come and come to visit us, having a stable, secure, and reliable Wi-Fi connection will make their experience with us a lot more um, comfortable if they run into uh, delays with their appointment or it allows them the ability to have a safe, secure, stable connection to access any documents they need via the internet. Um, more so than a cellular signal, where um, even, even if they had to make a call over Wi-Fi versus cellular, not knowing the um, different carriers or what have you, that would allow them that, that flexibility as well. So just some, highlighting some of the key advantages to having a Wi-Fi network. Uh, what we do want to stress to the to the board is that we are not proposing to go completely wireless. We are the plan is to have a hybrid infrastructure where it's both wired and wireless, because there are certain disadvantages to Wi-Fi and where wired infrastructure will always um, be a more a, mo a more favorable solution. In certain cases where there's large amounts of data that needs to be transmitted, such as our backup jobs that could run for many many hours. Having a wired connect, having that server on a wired connection is still the more um, safe and um, excuse me, not safe, but the more reliable connection. Just to make sure that particular item can complete, can complete from beginning to end. With Wi-Fi, unfortunately, is the signal, so there that run that does bear the the risk of other signals interfering with that. And we we occupy a building in Pasadena with other tenants, so and which also have their own Wi-Fi network. So there's the possibility that there could be signal interference with those other tenants of the building. And depending on the building material and what have you, there's always the chance that signal coverage and stability could be affected, even if a new device that's not wireless but is emitting emitting a radio frequency could um, hinder the signal itself. So. 
just wanted to bring to the trustees to bear in mind that it is not, we are not going completely wireless, but having a hybrid approach to all of that. So after just speaking about some disadvantages and advantages of Wi-Fi, here is a quick few points regarding the actual project overview itself. So we will get into, um, when we were designing the, the Wi-Fi infrastructure and trying to determine the, how to build the most robust and reliable network for Lacera, we considered these three key factors here. So with multiple service set identifiers or SSIDs, this basically allows us the flexibility, flexibility to build out um, segmented independent Wi-Fi connections for, for specific purposes. So what you see in front of you is just a, an example of, of what we can build out. We can have a primary network for Lacera staff to connect to. We can have a segmented visitor or guest network. And then we can also spin up a third network for certain things such as bring your own devices if that is something that Lacera pursues in the future. Um, with the access points and the network that we have we have scoped out for this particular project. We have the ability to build up to 32 independent networks, but we have no intention to, to utilize all 32 in and of itself. Um, but again, those, set, those networks will be segmented all together on their own. So the network traffic will not cross through any of the different networks. And we can build security settings around each network as we see fit. So systems and uh, with, in collaboration with the information security office, we'll make those determinations as we test and configure the network itself. So in terms of secure connections, um, again, the, the solution we selected allows us to use the latest um, net wireless networking security protocols, um, 802.1S network security, basically stipulates that um, any device that tries to connect to the wireless network needs to authenticate to one of the servers uh, with credentials before it's allowed access. If it doesn't authenticate correctly, it will be dropped and won't have any access to the network itself. Um, we, we plan to leverage single sign-on as well using multi-factor authentication just to ensure the security of any device we allow on the network has been validated before it's allowed um, to connect. Um, the wireless access points that we chose also have the latest technology in terms of detecting rogue devices and other, other um, signals, if you will, and they actually will send signals to our monitoring system where they, we can action upon that information to either um, shut off that device or not de or deny its access or anything to that effect. And again, those, those considerations will be done in conjunction with information security. For the wireless access points, we plan to segment it, further segment them into two, almost two separate networks in and of themselves. This will allow us to basically bring down half the access points if needed to do maintenance and, and upgrades as needed, but also allow the, the rest of it to be accessed so that staff won't lose any connectivity as they go about their day-to-day -day business. Now with the implementation plan of the Wi-Fi network uh, project, we, we established a five phase approach to all of it. Um, the first phase is actually as um, funny as it sounds, we do actually do have to do wiring to get wireless. So we first phase was basically installing the fiber, the fiber lines and the cables themselves. The second phase would be hanging our wireless access points. Phase three would be installing the network switches. Uh, phase four would be the initial turn up testing and developing an acceptable usage policy around the usage of the Wi-Fi of Wi-Fi. This is something that is new that is new that's being introduced to Lacera staff. So we want to work in conjunction with information security, HR, and legal to establish an appropriate acceptable usage policy before we roll out anything. And then the, the last phase would be to actually go live with the system in and of itself. So with that, we're happy to report that the fiber and cables have been run in all the Lacera suites. This means that we can start our, with our second phase of actually installing the access points, which are slated to begin tomorrow, actually. We just got confirmation that all the wiring cables and what have you have been completed. Um, Pinnacle, who is our vendor installing the wiring, is on site and testing the, testing the signals strength as they go through go about it. Unfortunately, 
at the time we, pre we prepared the material for this presentation and for the operational oversight committee, we did receive some news that there is a delay with receiving our network switches. Um, this delay is actually related to the global um, chip shortage and is actually pushed our Wi-Fi implementation out to December, 2021. That is the earliest date that the manufacturer has actually stated that they can deliver the network switches. So we can move forward with installing all the access points and pulling the uh, and um, doing some signal string testing, but the actual configuration, the security configurations of the project has been delayed. Um, optimistically, we're hoping December 2021 is a true date, but we've also heard that it could extend further, um, given that the global chip pandemic, the global chip shortage is causing um, resource constraints across all markets and so, so. And with that, that concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank I you would just like to hear from the uh, site. So. I think Kiho would like to hear from Saiso, I believe he said. Yes, thank yes. you. And I, I believe I, that's what I heard too. Um, yeah, we have been working with the, uh, the uh, systems team all along on their configuration. Uh, I have a couple of uh, staff members on my team that are uh, uh, 802.x, uh, you can do an 802.x certification of the configuration and settings. And so we're going to follow those NIST guidelines, 800.53, to take those through uh, and work with Summy's team to make sure all those installations are done properly and, and follow those guidelines. Does that answer your question, Mr. Kehoe? Hopefully, yes. Anybody else? Any other comments? Hearing none. Great. Hearing none, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. And thank you very much. Moving forward. Oh, it, it looked uh, like there was a question from Lewis inside the chat. Uh, oh, OK, Mr. Lugo. Yep, Vice Chair, and, and I can ask it towards the end. It uh, actually has to do with the motion with the insurance renewals, but I'll wait to the end to ask that. Okay, uh, next item is Public Records Act presentation. Yes, yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Santos um, and members of the committee and trustees. I'm John Harrington, Staff Counsel with the Legal Division. Uh, thanks for this opportunity for us to uh, present the Public Records Act. I'd like to also thank um, the staff because without staff, this program would not be successful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the public view into the inner workings of government is often overlooked, but it's vitally important. Um, that just along that vein, I'd like to just let you know that Bonnie's assisting me here. That's a little bit of view into the inner workings because I wasn't able to get my presentation to work. Um, so I prefer interactive presentations. Um, I think they're much more engaging. So if you see something on the screen that you wanna ask questions, do it as it's there, don't wait till the end. So if something piques your interest, um, just print it out and print it out, I mean, point it out and uh, we can address it there. Um, so with that, uh, the next slide, Bonnie, please. So our goal today is to give your committee um, a high level refresher on the Public Records Act um, and a look into how staff administers a PRA program uh, for, for the fund. Um, so we'll cover some important requirements and some issues um, uh, that, the, that the, record, the Public Records Act gives us, as well as um, a look into what our plans are, what Lacera's plans are for the future of the PRA. And when I say PRA, just it's a shorthand for Public Records Act for those that you know, if I start using acronyms, slow me down. Um, um, and, and like I said, I like interactive, so I'm not just going to read the slides because I figure you guys have all had them, so, so there's no reason to go through those. Um, so with that, slide three. Um, so when you think of the Public Records Act um, and, and the definition of what a public record is, if you can think in the broadest terms you can imagine, you probably won't ever overestimate the definition of a public record. Um, they pretty much include everything that Lacera possesses. Um, so the, the definition is quite broad of what a record is. It's really anything that, like the name says, is recorded 
in any format. It can be electronic, could be audio, can be video, can be paper documents, just anything you can, emails, texts, um, including um, uh, in some cases the record, uh, the, the court has held like phone records of who's, who's called different people. So just keep that in mind that it's a very broad definition of what a public record is. Uh, next slide, please. So our process is, is very open. Um, we're committed to providing service and we try to outshine other public agencies in this area. We try to go above and beyond just what the statutory requirements are. We really want to provide a service to the public. Um, and we often, our team often receives feedback um, about both the detail of our responses um, the, uh, and the timeliness. Uh, we have a very good track record of meeting all the statutory timelines. Um, and when I say the detail, I mean, we actually follow above and beyond the letter of the, of the act. We actually give, um, if we redact something or exempt something, we give a specific citation, but not only the citation, we give the reason why the citation applies to that redaction. So um, I know other agencies may not go into that detail, but we feel we owe it to the public and we take that extra bit of time. And, and it also gives us less likelihood of pushback because when you fully explain the reasons why, oftentimes people agree and understand. Um, so Lucera has several ways to request records uh, fr from the fund. The most common is via email. Uh, with the implementation of lucera.com, we hope to uh, change that and uh, pr publish as much as we can on the website. Uh, next slide, please. So our effort to publish more information online has saved staff time um, in responding to requests. With the rollout of the new lacera.com and our effort to publish as much information as possible, we expect this trend to continue. In the years past, requests tended to be member related. That was due to a big interest in pensions in general, what the government is paying, how beneficiaries are paid out, how much they get. However, in the past few years, I would say it's trending more towards our investment side. As far as the numbers of requests, we get a lot more uh, investment related. Uh, fees, holdings, earnings, things like that. Uh, they want to see a deeper dive into the types of investments, how much we're paying for them, what our returns are. Those come from both members of the public as well as uh, services like data aggregators and news agencies. Next slide. And I'm just going to keep moving unless you ask questions. <laughs> so transparency is a core value at Lacera. I think it's it's instilled into all uh, employees and it, I think it goes up and down the chain. It's not something that, um, it's just part of the culture. And I think it gives the public confidence that Lacera administers the fund openly and in the best interest of the beneficiaries and the public, because after all, we are investing uh, both money from the beneficiaries and the public. So the legal office uh, along this vein prepares a PRA report to the OOC um, for the previous month's requests, as well as our responses, it includes the dates, what documents were requested, when we responded, who requested them. So this provides transparency to the public, it provides transparency to the board, and, uh, the, and keeps the trustees informed. Next slide, please. So there are occasions where transparency and our duty to the fund and the beneficiaries become competing interests. For example, if uh, let's say an investment company sees that we're investing with one of their uh, one of their rivals, we don't want Lacera to be used as a tool that would reveal that our partner's proprietary or trade secret information. Um, in the end, that would lose valuable opportunities for Lacera, and would more than likely lower our returns because as we lose opportunities, we have less um, area to invest in. That, that, make, you know, that, that puts us into a, an area where we may not be able to make some good quality investments. And, and where that would come into play, where I say like to reveal proprietary information, oftentimes uh, as you have a fiduciary duty, so does the staff, we have a fiduciary duty to present to the, the trustees all of the due diligence material. And so a lot of that material would never be revealed to our staff or our board if if the company we we're asking all of the questions to knew that it was going to be made public. So the, 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 the PRA does allow um, several specific exemptions for that type of disclosure. Next slide, please. So the people of California, all, all people in California have, 
and then that includes people, companies. I mean, anybody in California has a fundamental constitutional right to view the business of the government. And so therefore, the right to receive records constitutionally must be interpreted broadly. So if, there's, if it's in doubt, we release the record. The ability to exempt records, entire records from disclosure or to exempt, you know, redact certain portions must be applied narrowly. So the legislature has created specific instances. And right now, I think the count is 76 specific instances that allow records to be exempt or portions of documents to be redacted. Uh, when, so when we cite something like I, I, I discussed earlier, when we cite an exemption, we go to the specific uh, statute and say, this is the statute, this is the type of document or information we're redacting, and here's why. So that's why it's important to kind of put those two concepts together. It, it, we do, I believe, a great job of giving that information out. So we're, we're doing that balancing of protecting our investments as well as being as transparent as possible without doing harm to the fund or to the beneficiaries. Next slide, please. So there's typically a few tweaks every year here and there uh, regarding the Public Records Act. And this year I wanted to point out two proposed changes that are currently in, in, in this session. The first one I think is probably the most impactful or it has the most potential for impact for the public, which is to appoint a PRA ombudsman, ombudsperson, including you know, all the support staff and everything that goes along with that office. This would be a new office. And it's, I, I would think of it like a clearinghouse for, as, as an action for requests that get denied by public agencies. There would be an office where that public agency you send a complaint to them and say, this is what I asked for and here's why it was re you know, redacted or, or, or um, not, not given out. So you know, can we please get you as an expert in, in this field to, to see the entire record and maybe contact the agency and see if they've complied with the, with the PRA. So I think that really is a, a positive aspect in, in improving transparency in government. So, uh, and I think Lacerra would embrace something like that given our record of release of documents, I think that actually will bring other agencies maybe that aren't as transparent as us up to a higher standard, which I think is a good thing. It's healthy for us, it's healthy for the public you know, to have that sight into how we're operating. The second uh, uh, code or second legislation that's, that's in, in deliberation is um, renumbering the entire Public Records Act and then aggregated, aggregating that code into one section. Because there are, there are um, portions of the Public Rec Record Act that kind of are here and there and they're not necessarily, you know, it was done organically. So there was never, you know, over the years since the Public Record Act was adopted, there's been a lot of changes and they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily make sense in the order because you'll have different types of government entities that have different rules and they're kind of scattered all over the place. Um, so they're, 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 they're gonna try to make that more uniform. So like our investments, for example, the exemptions we've used be kind of in one spot rather than here and here and here and here they'll be in one place. So it's really just, it's more of a cleanup. I don't see any material effects other than it should be easier to find things for, for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So in the spirit of openness, inclusivity and transparency, any records we post to the web must meet certain statutory requirements. And the legislature has put those out there. This scheme is not requiring Lacerda to post records. It's just simply laying out the rules for when we do post, what we have to comply with. So there, right now, there's not a whole lot of compelled disclosure. There are a few areas that do have um, required reporting um, on the website, but it's pretty limited in my opinion. Um, but with that said, we do post quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another area that's been kind of in the news or you know, in, at the forefront of PRA is, is the use of personal devices in, uh, in, in business relating to Lacerra or Lacerra business. So this is probably one of the areas that we receive the most questions about in the legal office from staff. Um, they wanna know what are the rules uh, and they do seem a little confusing at first, but in the end, when you see them as a whole, they do make sense. And so I would say the basic rule is that if a Lacerra official, that would include trustees um, or employee, use their personal device to conduct Lacerra business, 
any record created is subject to the PRA. So it falls under the same rules as anything else that we've that we've done, whether it's a you know a document we've created, a report that's at a board meeting, whether it's an email, those are all subject to the PRA because they are now records because it's the business of Lucera. So the best advice I can offer anyone is to only use your personal device or personal email when it's necessary. And uh, don't use it as your main communication tool to do Lacera business. It then becomes subject to the Public Records Act. So like I said, next slide, please. And I, I wanted to highlight this for trustees uh, because that, that last slide may, you know, may have piqued your interest. So the rules apply to trustees um, just as they do to staff. The law is very clear um, that if a request is made, trustees are obligated to search their devices for records. So in a case like that, uh, if let's say I receive or someone at Lucera receives something where it says, we want to see all emails from this trustee to the, the CIO or the CEO or whomever, or any employee at Lucera, it can be that, that general. The we would send um, a notice to the trustee or trustees in question and uh, we being the legal office, we would send a, a notice out saying, here is the request, this is the entire request, so we would give you the request and then give you our interpretation of what searches you should run on your device. And that includes Lucera devices. And I just wanted to note that staff does not have access to your device. Uh, we, uh, we don't have access to, your, to anything. So that's why we request that search to be done by you. And we just assist you in that search by, by informing you, here's the search, here's what we're asking for. This is the, the, the terminology you should be searching for in your device. Um, and that would include Lucera devices and uh, Lucera email. Uh, public or your private device and your private email if and only if used for Lucera business. Um, and but those just keep in mind, those are all subject to the Public Records Act exemptions as well. So that just doesn't mean everything you have is open. It just means it's subject to the act, including the exemptions. And also where uh, staff is always here to, ass to assist anybody that would need assistance retrieving records. So you could always um, you know, come in or grant us remote access and we could do the search for you or whatever you're, whatever level you're comfortable with. Next slide, please. So the PRA and the Brown Act have a bit of um, interplay and, and, and as, as it comes to transparency, they are both um, public facing requirements for the, the Brown Act you know, is, is the application specifically to the trustees and the way we hold our meetings and our obligation to, like we said, do our business in public. Uh, and, and that relates to the PRA as far as transparency. So the reason I wanted to bring this up, even though this isn't a Brown Act, they do have a little bit of crossover. Um, the, the Brown Act does allow trustees to view and discuss uh, confidential records uh, in closed session. And this is done to assist the trustees to make decisions required to administer the fund or to make investment decisions or whatever the exemption happens to be. The legislature has recognized that some things are sensitive and need to be done um, in closed session. And with that, I mean, I'm sure um, the board, the trustees here are, are, are familiar with closed session and, and all the caveats that come with it. And we do a pretty good job of marking everything that is confidential. But if you ever have a question of whether something is confidential or not confidential, I would please uh, advise you contact the legal office and we will be able to make a, a decision for you and say, yes, you can discuss this outside of a closed session or no, you shouldn't release this outside of a closed session. So when in doubt, err on the side of saying something is confidential and ask before you would share it with anybody else. Next slide, please. So right now, the legal office and, and Lucera in general are going through, as you know, a lot of technological changes. We in the legal office are currently implementing a matter management software that I believe will improve our service to the public and to the board. And just a, a, an insight into that is we foresee a, um, a public portal on the website that would allow anyone to make a public record request directly to uh, our, our, our public rec records administration, um, enter it right in the website, and then we would be able to respond to that directly uh, through the software and push it out to the person that made the, re the request. Along those lines, the plan is to uh, 
as we said, publish as much on lacera.com as possible, which will hopefully lower the amount of requests and provide higher transparency to the public. And I believe that's my last slide, but let's check money. Um, with that, I have any questions that would conclude my, with, if you have any questions, that's my conclusion of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Any questions, comments? I don't see any. Um, okay. okay, so we're moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the next item on the agenda is, I believe it's the good of the order. I somehow don't like myself out. And I don't see the agenda here. Let me see. There we go. Uh, yes, this concludes the uh, all the um, matters, and then we go into. Uh, I just for staff review, Mr. Lugo, perhaps this is the opportunity for you to um, talk to us about the previous motion. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Santos. So the previous motion, just for staff direction, uh, I want to be clear that um, your the motion is for, is it just for this life cycle to be able to present the Board of Retirement, the full um, insurance renewal process, or is that for moving forward staff direction to be able to go directly to the Board of Retirement um, and present our insurance renewal? Uh, process. So just, just want to point a clarification there. I think pursuant to your memo or the staff memo, the request was uh, uh, for the future as well. Yep. That's what I understood. I don't know if my colleagues have different opinion on that, but certainly if there's any ambiguity, we can tackle that at the border retirement meeting because I know Mr. Kehoe may not be accessible at this point, and certainly we will want to entertain his uh, thoughts. But um, again, um, my intent uh, is for do it uh, uh, in the future, um, because it's in the best interest of the organization. And again, if there's a different opinion, we can always discuss it at the board when you guys come in and, and make your final recommendation. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Santos, that's helpful. Okay, all right, so at this point, uh, we'll go good to the order. Um, I'll let's do roll call, please. Um, Mr. Bernstein? Ms. Gray? Nothing. Uh, thank you, staff, for your presentations. Um, the good thing is you were able to keep my attention even though I'm dying here because it's uh, 140, Mr. Santos. But, you know, thank goodness we don't have uh, the disability meetings to go forward with, but... You mean you, you, you weren't told? <laughs> 10 minutes break and then we got the disability, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, I'm just rubbing it in. You know, it's just one of those days. Uh, and actually, the presentations were very good. And you did hold my attention because they are issues that affect all of us and that are very important. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Mr. Oakham? Yeah, I have nothing. And uh, I, I, I've got to tell you, um, yeah, but most of it was really exciting. I'm, I'm glad we got pieces of that last uh, uh, public information because particularly about ourselves, so we need to know what the hell we got to keep and not keep. So uh, thank you there, guys. Thank you. Mr. Moore? I'm nothing to add. Mr. Kehoe, are you there? Sure, if I uh, don't pick up my hand, I apologize for connection issues. Okay. Chair, Vice Chair Santos? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we understand, uh, Mr. Kiho, you're a very busy man as a captain. So I appreciate your diligence here. Um, yeah, I also like to take the opportunity uh, to thank the staff. Uh, really appreciate the different presentations. Um, appreciate uh, the discussion that we had both at the 
top board meeting as well as this uh, committee. Uh, I think it's important that we have the ability to have a frank discussion between ourselves and uh, all for the benefit of the organization. That's what is really important to me, that we move in more and more to be more efficient uh, for uh, members in the organization, and that is wonderful. Um, so thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. So I believe this concludes the meeting. A motion to adjourn will be in order. So moved. Thank you. You have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody.